So I think my biggest claim to fame is I died. And you died? I did. So I had a really good crash across. I will want to look back on this in 30 years time when I'm not racing anymore and say, you know, I gave that everything. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Insights of Everything podcast. Today's guest is a British Touring Car Championship driver, Aaron Taylor-Smith. Hello. Welcome. No, thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Amazing. So, I'm going to jump straight in. Cool. How did you get into driving? I think motorsport has always somewhat been in my blood. Like, I grew up around it. Um, and, like, it was something that from an early age I always had a significant interest in. And I think, like anything, like, you... You, would, you look at a sport when you're younger and you kind of idolize it. So to be fair, like what I'm currently doing is like my childhood dream. So it feels really bizarre to be able to do this as a full-time profession um, because when I was like 10 years of age, this is literally what my dream was. So it's, um, yeah, it's been a lot of hard work, but again, it is a dream. So how do you get into karting? Because obviously like, when you're younger, normally it's like a rugby or yeah. football. What, what made you think about I karting? Think to a degree, like like my family were involved in motorsport, so I always had an invested interest in it. Um, and I think like knowing that like you, a lot of the top tier drivers around the world all started refining their craft at a young age in karts. So I started in Ireland, um, and like over the course of a couple of years, became like the national kart champion. Then went to Europe, did quite well out there. Um, but it all started in carts and it, it feels so weird like anytime like you go back and I watch like young kids racing carts now it's crazy to think that that's what I was once doing um, and where that has gotten to like they seem like worlds apart but at the end of the day all the basics are still the same um, so I think that's where it came from and I was fortunate enough that I probably took to it quite quick so I've noticed myself that if I ever take up a sport unless I have a very good entry level of performance. I'll, uh, if I don't have a good entry level of performance, I'll lose interest. <laughs> so it was quite convenient that I was pretty handy as soon as I got in one. Um, yeah, and that just got the wheels turning, so to speak, and we kept going. So is with karting, is it like, um, do you do it at the weekend? Yeah. So like you'll find like over in the UK, like the karting industry is huge. Um, I'm pretty sure nearly every, say, Formula One driver will have started in carts in the UK in some capacity because the level is so high over here. I don't really know why. I think England is just like the hub of motorsport. It's very unusual. Like when you look at any championship around the world, there's normally a British driver doing very well in it from Formula One to British Touring, well, obviously British Touring Cars, to, to even Blancpain, WEC, anything. They're all very high-level drivers. So... That's kind of where the focus went to, is to like to get over here and try pave a name for yourself in the industry. Um, but without karting at a young age, there's no way I'd be where I am now. How old are you? Like, how old do you have to be to be able to start? Is so it? it's crazy. Like, I think you can go in like bambinos now from something like six, which oh, wow. is like so like. Oh like they're gosh. so small. Like I say, I could barely kick a football at that <laughs> age. <laughs> like it's crazy. And like I started when I was thirteen, I think it was, which is relatively late. Mm. Like people will start normally. Cadets is kind of the entry one at the age of I think it's eight. Um, and people will stay in it until they're in their early twenties. Wow. So I think I did maybe three slash four seasons of karting before we had the opportunity to progress into cars. Um, but yeah, like yeah, kids will start from the age of six these days. That's crazy. Like if you and like. A, I'm one of those people that like, you know that saying, like to be a professional at anything, you need to accumulate 10,000 hours. Mm -hmm. So if someone starts karting at the age of six, they're going to reach those 10,000 hours so quickly yeah. that by the age they could be like 15 or 16, they're already a professional at it because they've accumulated those hours. Um, so I think, yeah, starting younger, like obviously has an advantage, but at the same time, like for a six-year-old to be in a kart nearly every mm -hmm. single weekend is is pretty intense yeah so mm. is it like so when you go there is there like a group of people that you always race against yeah it is and like, like a team sort you'll of. go like up and down the country um, or even across into europe so like you'll probably find all the same faces and normally they're racing three of the four weekends of the month be it like completely nationwide so it's a huge it is like a grassroots level of motorsport but mm. at the same time there's so much potential to gain those valuable hours and refine the craft because the cost 
jump from going from go-karts mm -hmm. into cars is astronomical. Yeah. So if you can have mm -hmm. learned your craft and refined your like race craft, your qualifying performance, all those details that by the time you go into cars, you can maximize the opportunities you have. So you end up racing against the same faces, like even in the touring car bubble now, a lot of the drivers that are on the grid, we all raced against each other in cars. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So like oh, it's, nice. it's such a weird community because you started young, you all went off on different channels and then you just come back together at this like the top tier of it. Um, so it's quite interesting that you get to, yeah, to experience it from that side. So your brother is a, was a racing driver. Yeah. Is, do you think that's kind of one of the reasons you got into karting? Most definitely. Him? Yeah, like, and I, and I think growing up, like, like, like any young kid, like, you probably idolized your brother. Like, yeah. do you know what I mean? Like, you wanted to be better. You wanted to <laughs> yeah. be more competitive. Like, it didn't matter to me if it was go-karting. It didn't matter to me if it was tennis. It didn't matter what it was. I always wanted to be the best of all my <laughs> siblings. And I grew up with, with four older brothers. Um, do I have four other brothers? Yeah, I do. I have four other brothers. <laughs> yeah. And like, so straight away, it was like an ultra competitive household where because I was the youngest by quite a while, it was like, right, let's see like how good I can be. Mm -hmm. um, and like, yeah. to prove you were like. Most definitely. Like, I feel like that was, it was one of the benefits of growing up with all those like older siblings because mm -hmm. you wanted to be that little bit better than all of them. Um, so I'd say it started from a very young age, from playing Mario Kart to <laughs> then into karts, then into cars, and now into touring cars. Um, so yeah, I do think Gavin paved the way in some regards, but more so gave me a competitive edge at a young age. Amazing. Mm. So with karting, is there like certain tracks that you race? What was your favorite that like? <sighs> like this is such a blast in the past. Like, like I feel like, because I haven't, I never really deep dive back into karts. Like I feel like, because we did everything around Europe, like, geez, I can't even think of where my favorite one would be. Like, I probably always like going to Mondello, which mm -hmm. is an Irish track, um, just because it was, it was the closest one to my house. <laughs> like, I know that sounds bizarre. <laughs> like, everything I do over here, obviously, you can tell by my dodgy accent that, well, I'm not just here to try sell you paving or clean your gutters. <laughs> like, I come over here to go racing. But so it was, it was really odd being in an environment where I could go to a track that was only 30 minutes away from where I lived. Um, so that was quite cool. So I probably have the fondest memories of karting in Mondello. Mm -hmm. Um, but also, like, the opportunities to go around Europe and out to, like, Lake Garda in Italy and everything was amazing. And I absolutely, like, I look back on it now and I think, like, that was such a mad way to have spent my youth. Um, but so fortunate and so fortunate for everyone's support in making it possible. Because at the age of 12, 13, 14, whatever it may have been, like, you needed a huge support network. You needed a family structure that would provide, like, help, assistance, bring you places. Like, yeah. at the end of the day, like, a lot of traveling was involved in it. And without that, there's no way I would have been able to continue down this route and get to what I'm now doing. It is crazy when most kids, you say what you've done the weekend, it's like, I've gone, like, food shop or something. Yeah. You know, they're, like, racing in Italy. It's it is. Crazy. Like, like, it was mad. Like, like, and I think, like, like... People don't realize, like, I would say, like, my whole life has been dedicated to this sport, mm -hmm. like, from a young age, like, like, and it's not like, woe is me, but there's a huge amount of sacrifice needed to be at the top of your game in any sport, and motorsport is one of those, where, you know, you miss out on a lot of things that young kids got to have done, mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, this is what I wanted. It's like, what paid off. A hundred percent. Like, I, I say, like... I have the world's most addictive personality because I want to be the best at everything I do. And in some regards, it was probably very beneficial for me to have a sport to channel that energy <laughs> yeah. into because I'd say I would have been like an absolute loose cannon if not. <laughs> um, so yeah, like I missed out on certain things growing up, but at the same time, this is what I wanted. Um, and no one forced me. Like if I had said, oh, I don't want to do this anymore, no one would have said anything, but this is all I have ever wanted. Yeah. Um, and I think the hard work has paid off, which is quite nice. Like it's, it's nice when you get to this point and you can, you know, you're now, I'm now in a position where I'm getting to look at like every day, like going into a race weekend, this weekend as these are the best moments of my life. Do you know what I mean? Like everything I've ever wanted is right here in front of me. And I think it's nice to be able to reflect on that in the moment rather than when you're like, 60 years of age yeah. being like oh those were the good old days where actually i feel like i'm currently living, living them. yeah yeah yeah, oh, that's yeah. Amazing. which is mad so it is quite cool in that regards that's crazy so when how do you go from like karting to um 
a racing like league sort of thing yeah. is there like because i know sometimes obviously you can go from like racing to touring cars or to yeah. f1 how would you go to like the next level of i think you need like and i've always said this like there's not a whole lot that divides me as a driver away from the fans that are at the tracks apart mm -hmm. from opportunities mm -hmm. so opportunities came my way in terms of being able to progress into one of the feeder series for what the touring cars were back in the day which is called the clio cup and um, so when i was 16 we got signed with Renault to go and do the Clio Cup. Um, and that was really, really was what catapulted me from carts to cars. And like that opportunity, one year later may not have been mine. One year earlier definitely wouldn't have been mine. So that timing was, was what has made this jump and this career path viable. Um, and it's really hard. Like I, like I always say, like when young drivers ask, like, how do you progress through the ranks? Firstly, I'd be like, you should just buy a set of golf clubs. It'd be so much easier. <laughs> um, but then secondly, I'm like, it, it's it's about like never saying no to an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Like you, like motorsport is so unique because you meet such a wide range of people, personalities, companies, everything. And unless you are, you know, unless you're able to connect with them on a different mm -hmm. level and not solely rely on the sport, that's then you'll never be successful mm -hmm. and i think we've mm -hmm. i've been really fortunate over my time to have found the right people the right mentors whatever way you'd want to put it to have allowed me to keep going to this to this level so it's literally the right place right time it is like so yes, like like, like that's it like I, I like every opportunity like you know you, you know yourself when like when you finish school like at, over like at home it's called like your leaving cert over here it's your a levels like I remember like when everyone finished their like A levels equivalent and they all go away on their like, you know, their 18 year old holidays and everything like that. Like obviously that was never on my agenda. Yeah. So like straight away, like it would have been very easy to be like, no, I don't want to do that race because I'd love to go to Thailand for three <laughs> months with, yeah. with a bunch of guys and live your best life. But at the same time, that would have shot down the opportunity in mm -hmm. terms of where I wanted to get to. So I think saying yes to, to every opportunity that allows you to pursue your goal, not every opportunity will put you down that channel. It'll take you off path and, and almost filtering out the noise of it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Learning about like, you know, what people are there to support you um, and see you do well. And I think it's really particularly hard. Like, and I would say, like, it's probably the same for guys and girls, but mm -hmm. at a young age, like being involved in a sport, like you get admiration um, for weird things. Like at the end of the day, like it's things that you don't really notice you're doing. Mm. Um, so I think it'd be very easy to like fall into the wrong circles and yeah. like surround yourself with people that just want to be part of the journey to say that they can do this with you. So I think like, especially for a young guy, like I think it's, it's really important to be like confident in your own self and not to be um, not easily led astray. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's. I don't know where that tangent came from, but I feel, I feel, I feel like it's important to say. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So um, with the Clio Cup, yeah. how long were you... So is that the one just below it the... Is. So a lot of them, it's not the support race for the touring cars anymore, but probably for like a 10 or 12 year period, it was the primary feeder series for the mm -hmm. touring cars. The cars were basically a mini touring car. Um, so you're driving at the age of 16. You can't even do that. No, anymore. like, like I, I was, I, yeah. Like, how did like, you learn to drive? Like? It, it was so odd. Like, I like still can't really drive. Let's call it a So what you call it? Like, it, it was so bizarre to, to be racing a Clio at the age of like 16, like where you couldn't have a road license, you couldn't have anything. Yeah. But like, it's odd, like, because like my touring car is left-hand drive, where oh, really? people always be like, oh, does that not mess with your head? I'd be like... I never even noticed where if you bring me, like we went away for a wedding to Italy and I had to drive on the left-hand side of the road or on the left-hand side of the car. And it was the most confusing thing in the world. <laughs> like, or it, yeah, like I, I was trying to figure out which side of the car I was at on. Yeah. <laughs> and like driving on the roads is infinitely harder for whatever reason, because when you're going flat chat in a touring car or a Clio, it just feels natural. Yeah. Where when you're 16 or 17 and you're trying to pull out into a roundabout, you're like, this is the worst experience of my life. <laughs> like you're used to just like crashing over that's it. Like, go I, by and it's like people are all, people are always like oh my god you've parked so badly over there I'm not a professional parker no. like I'm not able to like do all of this like <laughs> all I do is drive around in circles as fast as I can <laughs> like there's no parking required so therefore the fundamentals of driving I'm probably not great at yeah. <laughs> um, where I feel like I can get the most out of a car on a track <laughs> how long how many times does it take you to pass your test two failed the really? first time 
I failed the first time, I would say, within about 60 seconds of leaving the driving center. Um, and like, I'm always one to think that I'm right, but I was right <laughs> on this occasion. So there was like, it's like a dual carriageway, slip road off a dual carriageway. I thought it was just a blend lane, but there was red lights, drove straight through them. Oh, and like, yeah. didn't obviously cause anything, like stopped at the line to pull out and they're like, oh, that was a red light. I was like, oh, brilliant. So if I failed, and they're like, yeah, so you may as well just go back to the driving test oh, center. No. And I would say, I would say I was back out of the car within like 90 seconds of leaving. I'm being oh, like, well, I'll have to rebook that. But Ireland is so backwards. So to give you an idea, I drove to the driving test center by myself, <laughs> failed the test, drove home, and I continued driving for another couple of weeks oh until the test came back around. Like, so you didn't have to have an instructor with you? No. Like, I, it's an Irish law. Like, I feel like I'm probably painting a bad picture here. Like, we don't have, <laughs> we're not like horse-drawn carriages or anything like that. But like, on a provisional license, it's just commonly accepted that you can just go driving. Like, it's so odd. Like, like you'll get stopped by the police, like, if you come across a random checkpoint, not if you're doing anything stupid. And they're like, oh, you should really have, like, a qualified driver with you. And they're like, yeah, I should. And they're like, okay, well, next time, make sure. That's the end of that. Like, it's wow. so bizarre. So, yeah, I drove to the driving test centre, failed my test, drove back home, and then rebooked it, and then went back two weeks later and passed it on that <laughs> occasion. <laughs> <laughs> oh god that's crazy yeah to be fair i think it took me like four times to that's a good effort first. like i feel like like <laughs> do you know what the problem is i think once you failed it a few times then you're just like oh i expect to fail this yeah. so if it's like i can understand unless you fail the first unless you pass it the first time i could see how it could go like five or six times yeah. of failing because you'll just do something silly each time because yeah. you're like ah crap I've after messing that up yeah but, i think yeah. i failed my first one like you said 60, 60 seconds into it i yeah. pulled out on a roundabout and I was like, oh, she probably just had her out. Like, yeah, 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 that's, that's the end of this. Like... down the drain, let's go again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so painful. <laughs> okay, great. So I'll go back to racing. Yeah. So, um, what, so when you were in the Clio Cup, I've got here that you went to Italy, is that yeah. right? Yeah. What made you move so to So this Italy? is very, it's a very technical thing. So touring cars and Clios are all front wheel drive. So in terms of extracting the most out of like tire life, um, you kind of have to refine the technique of like front wheel drive quite a bit because the Italian Clio Cup is probably one of the bigger domestic Clio Cups around the world. Like the grids are like 40 cars. They're all very good drivers. Wow. But the temperature is so hot out there that it's really about technique and finesse of looking after the tires. Um, so we did a season out in Italy to maximize my performance. So in terms of like driver development. And I do think that paid huge dividends because you, you learned at a, an accelerated rate effectively because every race it was 30 plus degrees where the tires will go off as soon as you leave the pits where... Over in the UK, you might do one race in the season that's over 30 degrees. The rest are 15 to 20 degrees, and tire wear isn't really an issue in them. Um, so you learn a lot. So I went out there to kind of, yeah, maximize my own driving, um, learn more about the technique of front-wheel drive, and I think, yeah, it, did, it paid dividends in the end. So when you're in those races, is it like, you say there's 40 cars, is that mm -hmm. like... People, um, different drivers from different countries. Yeah, so like the Italian or? one was really big. Like it was crazy. Like we went to everywhere from like Imola to Monza to all like the big Formula oh, One tracks. Monza. Yeah, did well, you I, do the street race? So we didn't. We did the actual circuit, and I won around Monza, which is really cool because you go you go out to an Italian championship. So I would say seventy percent of the grid are thoroughbred Italians. <laughs> the other <laughs> the other thirty percent are European drivers. So to win on their home soil at their most iconic circuit mm. is really cool. Yeah. Um, but it was it was an amazing experience. And I was probably doing that when I was like 20, which wow. was crazy. Um, but I loved it. And it was, yeah, like I learned so much about like the skill involved in driving front wheel drive. But all those tracks are just because they're so iconic. And I probably didn't, I probably took it a little bit for granted mm -hmm. back then. Um, but now looking back, I'm like, that was a really cool opportunity. You can turn around and say you've raced on like Yeah, this yeah, one. yeah. It's quite cool. And do you know what? I, you know the way they always say you get you get faster with old age. Like when you look back and you're like, do you know something? I was really good back then. <laughs> maybe that's what's happening. Like maybe I was rubbish back then. I don't know. But like <laughs> I somehow fluked winning the odd race here or there. So that was pretty good. That's amazing. Um, but it's a cool thing to have. Like it's cool. It's a cool like accomplishment to to mark off the list, so yeah. to speak. So when you were racing um, back with the 
um, Clear Cut, were you, was that like full time or were you doing so no, like, like weirdly enough, like, so I was still, I think I was still in like second level, is it second level? Yeah, second level education. So in Ireland, the school system, like everyone really stays on to do their effectively mm -hmm. A-levels. So I was still balancing my mm -hmm. A-levels with going racing. Oh, wow. Um, and then, I don't know why I did this, but I decided that I'd go to university and I've qualified as a structural engineer. I never oh, did really? anything with it. Like. It, I don't know why I did it. And structural engineering is so hard. Like, I should have just done something, like, like real easy, like arts. I'm not saying there. If, anyone's, if anyone's in arts, that's, that's totally fine. But it would be hard. But in Ireland, I think it would be pretty easy. Uh, <laughs> instead, I decided to do structural engineering. But to be fair, like, the uni were really accommodating and mm -hmm. were able to give me, like, a sports scholarship. So the four-year course was done over six years. So I only ever had to do, like, half the modules each oh, semester. That's good. So I could still travel loads, mm -hmm. um, I could still do all that. Never done any structural engineering and I wouldn't trust me to design like <laughs> anything. Um, but somehow I, I fluked that, um, qualified as that. And as soon as I left university, um, that's when I moved mm -hmm. over to England for a couple of years. Because um, touring cars was really starting to take off for yeah. me. Um, but I guess like maybe it was sensible to have a backup plan, but that's not what it felt like. Like it felt like because almost everyone goes to university back in Ireland that it felt like that's just the norm. Yeah. Like I was like, right, this is what I'm going to go do. And then what was once a hobby started to turn into a profession. So then I just had to keep going, so to speak. Um, and I'm glad that I, I did it because I yeah. think that analytical style of thinking has really stood to me over the years. Um, but yeah, like, so it was, it was hard balancing all of it. Like, like studying for exams when you're like going to race at Silverstone, you're like, this is so weird. Like this just this feels like <laughs> two different worlds. Um, but yeah, I was, I was fortunate to get to do it. Uh, is it. And then did you move to, is that when you went to Red Bull? So I did that in university. Um, so as God, I was coming you, out. You've got busy life. Yeah, I feel <laughs> like what I've learned is unless I'm like chock-a-block busy, I feel like I'm not achieving anything. Yeah. So like it's my worst attribute is that I feel like I have to be run off my feet. Um, so I, I think I was with Red Bull for maybe three, two or three years, um, which was a really cool experience because I got to see sports marketing from a different perspective, mm -hmm. from the perspective of being the company and like, and almost being able to see how athletes and how poorly managed partnerships were. Mm -hmm. So I would say that was probably one of my most valuable times before the racing really became like a big full-time commitment because I could... I could learn on someone else's dime, if that makes yeah. sense, of seeing the perils of what exists from extracting like marketing exposure from a partnership um, and just like working closely with a an athlete or a team or a sport. Um, so it was a really valuable time in my life and it was a really cool experience to do. Um, and I think, yeah, it was probably one of the most beneficial things that has stood to me over the last few years. Yeah, because now you know exactly what brands need from you. And yeah, you don't have to like, like... And, I, and I think, like, that's what, that's what I've learned over the years. Like, a lot of the drivers, particularly in touring cars, maybe aren't as aware of that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's not a one-size-fits-all. Like, and I think that's what's really unique about working with, with everything branded. Because we're able to utilize my existing partnership network to give a rate of return that probably wasn't initially envisioned. More like when people start into a British Touring Guard program, they look at it from, oh, they get 20 million viewers on ITV, we get X amount of social coverage, and that is really good. But if you rely solely on that, it would be very easy to get, the, get to the end of the season and be like, was the money that we invested into that driver or that team worth it? Probably not. Where when you're able to generate more of a customer base and bring more people into it, and before you know it then, it's a massive, you know, it's a cyclical. No, what's that word? I want to say like a circle. Oh, I don't know what that word is. That's my dodgy accent. We're just going to, someone's just going to edit that in and make it sound like I'm really intelligent. But it's reciprocal. There we go. Hey, there we go. Done. Got it. Uh, because then it becomes a reciprocal relationship where the, each partner benefits from the marketing exposure. Yeah a new customer base. Um, I think that's really important. And I learned all of that really with my time at Red Bull. Um, and I think that's where, I think that's what separates me from a lot of the drivers because I can see the commercial side of it mm -hmm. as much as the marketing side. Yeah. So when you go into um, your, the touring cars, do you like rely on the sponsorships that you yeah. receive? So I think when people, people don't realize, like, yes, it's a sport, but it's more of a commercial business than most people realize. Mm. So effectively, 
The teams need a fee to run the cars. To give you an idea, to run a British touring car to, to the, the top level of the sport, it's about £600,000 a year. Oh, wow. Um, it's obscene. And I always feel ridiculous because you could buy a lovely house outright for that. Yeah. But it's all then down to the team sponsors. Mm -hmm. um, and the team will normally have a title sponsor. Like, we're very fortunate with Car Store as ours this year. Um, so they come on board and they will heavily subsidize the drives. And then it's up to the drivers to then work with their partner network to bring the rest of the value in. Yeah. Um, because it's it's every, it's all about like, the championship is as much of a commercial business as it is a sport. Like to give you an idea, mm -hmm. like this is where the trade off comes. Like a 10th of a second in qualifying will probably cover five to six cars. Any test day we do, I could almost guarantee to you I will find a tenth of a second in the chassis. Mm -hmm. One test day is 10 grand. Wow. So when you think about it, it's like five or six cars in qualifying is nearly worth 10,000 pounds in oh your pre-season budget. So those are the decisions you're faced with. Mm -hmm. So when you're then, everything is done on like, I have the world's largest Excel sheet. Like, <laughs> like every figure is itemized, every penny is accounted for because you know exactly where it's all going yeah. and what that will do to, to your performance as the year goes on. Because unless it's spent in the right places, there's no point in having an abundance of budget to then waste it. Yeah. Um, it's about making sure it is spent in the right areas. And I think that's what we've done as a team really successfully this year. We've been able to develop the car and progress it more than what they've probably achieved in the last few seasons. So that's quite nice. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a huge balancing act of of making sure the sponsorship value is there mm -hmm. for your partnership network because then the finances are available to go and do the racing itself. Um, and I think people probably only see us on 10 Sundays of the year on ITV and think that's a really easy job. We're yeah. actually, I'd say that's like 1% of my time. Yeah. The other 99% of my time is spent from everything from the business side of it to the training side of it to, yeah, just making sure, like, like I joke, like, but like even the social media side of it is a full-time commitment mm -hmm. and I feel like I'm awful at it. But yet it's still going pretty well. Like I'd, I'd love to be better. I'd love to be able to put more time into it. Yeah. Um, there's so much that goes in that people never see. They never see the grind of it. They just see the end result. Yeah, people just think you just drive around a track a couple of times really nice. and you're done. Yeah, yeah and <laughs> instead, like I, I always say like the physical act of driving is almost the reward of all the hard work. Mm. So actually like... I always joke the race weekends are the most peaceful time of my <laughs> of my year because there's only one job to be done. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? All I can do is get in the car and do the best that I physically can. Mm -hmm. And if I can do that, I think we have a chance of winning. Where nine to five, well, not it's not nine to five, nine to nine, <laughs> five days of the week, you're all, you're always thinking, well, if I could find another partner, we could do another test day, which will find us another tenth of a second. Then we could try those springs on the mm -hmm. car and we could find a tenth and a half. And all of a sudden, you're in this like snowball effect of trying to maximize your performance, where at least on a race weekend, we know what's beneath us, so let's just do the best yeah, of Everything's what we can. been done, so yeah. then it's literally all you the need hard to do is, is done. Yeah, drive like the we, car. We and... go into this race weekend at Donington. When we tested here in our, in our mid-season tire test, we finished second overall. So I know That's the amazing. chassis is really fast around this track. So it's probably the best prepared we've been. And it's like, my whole philosophy is that no one will ever out-prepare me. So mm -hmm. if that's with setup work, if that's with simulator work, if that's with fitness training, whatever it takes, I will, I will want to look back on this in 30 years' time when I'm not racing anymore and say, you know, I gave that everything I had mm -hmm. and I'm really proud of what I achieved. So I feel like that's, no one ever sees that. They see yeah. like, they'll, they'll flick it on on Sunday morning and hopefully be like, you know, he's doing really well. That's, he must have woken up on the right side of bed where yeah. actually it's been months of preparation mm -hmm to get to this yeah um but i think that's what i love about it to be fair yeah it's um i do feel like like sometimes so, like, if i'm watching it i'm like oh like it's just a race but you actually like it's, it's also quite physical on the yeah. body as well because you're driving at such a speed oh yeah i'll be literally aware of like every single car around you and everything and most you definitely hit stop at the right time for strategy it's, it's, it's like, crazy like i always say like like the physical act of driving the car is one thing but the heat and concentration is another like mm -hmm. to give you an idea Inside the car, because they're sealed units, there's no air, there's no nothing because it affects air performance, mm -hmm. the cars will be a minimum of double the ambient. Now, that's like a minimum. So if it's 30 degrees, normally inside the car, it's between like 70 and 75 degrees. Oh so then if you think about it, like a sauna is 80. So 
It's kind of like doing a sauna on a spin bike wearing ski thermals for 30 minutes. So you're like, all right, best of luck. And do that three times in the day. So it's like, Gosh. it is so physical. Like, and I, I let down the entire Irish nation by not drinking. But I would say <laughs> on a Monday, I would describe how I feel as like the worst hangover you can ever imagine. Because yeah. your sweat body, so much as well, don't your you? body yeah. is so beaten up. But like your mind is like a zombie. Like mm. you feel like you're just like, like mashed potato <laughs> like when you wake <laughs> up. Like you're like something has gone categorically wrong. Uh, it's so it's so crazy how physically demanding the cars how are. How fast do you normally drive around the track? So I always get asked this question. When we go to Thruxton, which is the fastest track of the year, and we had, we had a really good run there. We had a top six. Like the car was very quick around there. And down the back straight, you'll normally get to about 155 mile an hour. Wow. So like you're really moving. Do you have a gear stick in the car? Or so it's a good question. So unlike GTs, we actually do, but it's a, a sequential gearbox. So it kind of looks like this lovely everything branded water bottle. <laughs> um, you pull it to go up through the gears and you knock it away from you to go down through the okay. gears. So we don't use the clutch. So we'll use the oh. clutch to leave the pit lane and the race starts. That's it. But even those three race starts on the clutch will be enough for the clutch to have to be taken out of the car when the car goes back to the workshop and get fully rebuilt. Like oh, that's wow. how much strain goes through it. So our gearboxes, yeah, we just like I left foot brake. So you don't take, you don't like, you don't press the clutch. You don't do anything for upshifts, downshifts. You just brake with your left foot, um, and as you come down through the gears, you'll normally blip the throttle as well, just to smoothen it out in the gearbox. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so we have we. We change gear with our hand. It's kind of like a road car, but not. When you look in them, you'll be like, that does not look anything like a road car. <laughs> so it's a, it's a pretty unique animal, to be and fair. And you have to pit a certain amount of times during a so race? So we only ever pit if the conditions change. Okay, so, so it's you quite don't have nice. to, because I know in F1 you have to pit. You have like... to. So like, and I kind of like that about ours. Like Ours is a sprint series. So there's three 30-minute races. Now, to be fair, there's been two races this year where you've had to pit. Mm. So Weather if, changing. Yeah, everything. exactly. Yeah. And if something goes wrong, you'll pit, blah, blah, blah. But generally speaking, on a good weekend, you won't have to. But to give you an idea, in qualifying, we will. So we'll go out in a 30-minute qualifying. We'll use three sets of tires. So we'll have to pit three times oh, wow. to change tires. So there is a degree of strategy, um, especially in qualifying, because you'll do two timed laps on a set of tires before they lose performance. Mm -hmm. So on that second time lap, you'll be communicating over the radio in the car with your engineer what setup changes you want made for the next set of tires because we're constantly evolving the car based on ambient. So even if the track condition changes by like two or three degrees, the level of grip that's available massively alters. Yeah. So you're always evolving um, and always changing. So those pit stops is primarily done on the Saturdays unless changing conditions come up on the Sunday, which is making, which is another stressor mainly on the engineers. <laughs> so you, with the tires, do you have like soft and hard tires? We do. Um, yeah, 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 this is good. This is a good question. So we have soft, medium, and hard. Yeah. Um, certain tracks, you'll use certain compounds. So, for example, Thruxton, which is really abrasive. It's like the surface feels like a cheese grater. Oh. Like, so it rips up tires. Yeah. You have to use the hard compound the whole time. Then on other tracks, like Darlington, where it's super smooth, we'll use the medium tire all weekend, this weekend. Um, some other tracks, where were we last? Knock Hill, you use the soft tire because it's such a short track. Mm -hmm. So you're constantly changing like strategy. And for each tire compound, there's quite a big setup change as well. Yeah. So you'll change everything from roll centers to springs to ride heights. You do so much to accommodate the different grip level of the tire. So during your qualifying, is that when you kind of like feel what a tire you'll need? And then in yeah. the race, you'll pick the one that you've... So that's it. So like we'll strategize like some race weekends, you'll have the soft, medium and hard tire available. Mm -hmm. And you'll have to use each of those tires in one of the races. Yeah. So one race will be soft, one race will be mediums, one race will be hards. So then during qualifying, you'll kind of get a feel for what the car is doing and you'll pick your tire strategy based on where the chassis is. Yeah. So you'll know, right, we have the best opportunity this weekend on the medium tire. So therefore, we'll use that in race one to make sure we stay in the front gaggle the whole time. Or, you know, you, you can play it if you've, if you've had a really good qualifying Sometimes you'll get the worst tire out of the way because you know yeah, then you... you're going to stay at the front because you're mm -hmm. near the front. And then you have a really good chance of success when others go on to the worst tire and you're on the better tire. So yeah. it, there's a lot of, um, a lot of like, engineering talk that goes on on like, race day morning, on Saturday nights to like, figure out the strategy of mm -hmm. when you're going to use what. 
Um, because you could have your like your whole strategy planned, but then like it's your racing, you get a downpour. And oh yeah, hundred like, percent. And then everything goes out the window. Then, yeah, like it's like it's crazy. Even things like you can have your brake disc strategy sorted, like because mm. we'll use three sets of brakes in every race or in every race weekend. Oh really? So even when they go on the car, is super important. Mm. Um, so yeah, anything like or even if you wake up and it's rained overnight, but it's dry in the morning the surface conditions have changed yeah. massively because the rain comes down, it brings up all the crap and dirt onto the top mm. of the surface. So the level of grip goes low. Even though this track is still dry, you change so much based on what's happened overnight. It's pretty crazy what goes into it. Yeah. How long does a, um, a pit stop last? So if we're doing a pit stop, it depends on what we're changing. Like some changes that we'll make, like especially during free practice, we'll pit every three to four laps to make a setup change. Some setup changes will take 30 seconds, some could take 10 minutes. Oh, really? So it depends how big of a change it is. So you get used to only ever doing three laps at a time. So the longest run you'll do in the car on any given race weekend will be in race one, when you mm. do the full whatever, if it's 18, 20 laps, whatever it may be to accumulate the 30 minutes of running. Um, so you only ever do short, snappy runs, so mm -hmm. you'll keep making setup changes. Some setup changes will come in and just adjust tire pressures, which takes five seconds, and then you're out again. Yeah. Um, but it's constantly evolving and making sure you're, you're kind of, yeah, making progress the whole time. Again, that's like, no one ever thinks about no, that. No, they don't. No one ever realizes how much, like, oh, like how much, as an like, engineer like, as well, it's such How much chatter job, yeah. there is over the radio. Like you're talking over the radio 24-7. Mm. Yeah. Um, is that distracting? No, it's not like, and it's funny, like I do a lot of work, um, particularly on simulators to get used to it from yeah. everything from like, oh, like, like one of the things that we do is, so I'll have a full simulator in my house. Um, when in your you're house? On, yeah, which That's is really cool. handy. It's very cool. Like, like, don't get me wrong, it's not a PlayStation, but it's pretty intense. Like, like <laughs> you get off, you're like, oh, I'm so sweaty. Like I'm literally <laughs> sat in like the, in the attic being like, what <laughs> is going on? But you'll do things like to get used to communicating over the radio. Like you'll be on the simulator and over the headset, I'll have like kids multiplication tables in my head. Oh, really? So it'll be like, what is 15 times eight? And you're doing the maths oh, wow. of it while you're driving. So then your subconscious mind gets used to driving the car mm. when your conscious mind can answer the questions. That's incredible. So it's about like making sure your lap time is within a tenth of a second when you're all your sensories are focused on driving and then when only a certain few of them, like your vision is. Um, that's a big advantage because then you can accumulate so many hours of people chatting to you over the radio without it affecting anything. Yeah. Like you can have full on conversations about the car at 150 mile an hour <clears throat> with wow. no impact on lap time. And you're still like aware of everything that's going on yeah, around you. Yeah, you're just well, there, like... Sometimes I'm aware of it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like oh, it's, you had any... it's, it's kind of hard. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, like you're, you're, it is pretty intense in that regards because you're constantly, especially touring cars, because you're always, you'll never do a race, unlike the likes of Formula One where you'll see them, they'll be together on lap one and mm -hmm. then they're gone. Then they may not overtake a car. Yeah. Where in, in touring cars, you will never do a lap or two by yourself. Oh, really? You're always in a gaggle of cars because it's, the cars are so evenly matched that yeah. you'll never have a second to the car in front and a second to the car behind so you can chill you'll have like a tenth of a second to the car in front and like half a tenth of a second to the car behind. So you're always running nose to tail. And yeah, you're not like Max Verstappen, just like Just chilling, cruising around. Out for a Sunday drive, taking it easy. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, unfortunately not. Like I feel like it's so intense because you never have a second to yourself. Yeah. Um, but I think that's what makes touring cars like so that's widely exciting, followed. Yeah. yeah, like like half the people that come along for the first time as part of my racing program may not have come to a touring car race. And all of a sudden then, from being at the track once, they get hooked on it. Because yeah. it's a different form. Like, it's so chaotic. Um, and it's so cool to be a part of it, to be fair. Yeah. So, um, no, I'm very fortunate in that regards to be able to to do this all the time. Like, it's it's crazy to me. How many, What would you say is your favorite car that you've driven in? Do you know, I think, like, it's funny. Like, like the Vauxhall Astra is obviously going really well for us this mm. year. Um, I feel like, because I, I did, was it maybe six or seven seasons back to back. Then we went and did a GT program for two years. And then I've come back. Um, so I was in the Cooper for two seasons and then we switched to the Vauxhall. And I would say this Vauxhall is really up there for me because it does everything that I wanted to mm. do. I feel like I don't have to adjust my driving to suit the car at all. I oh, can just good. get in and drive. Yeah. Um, One less thing to worry about. Yeah, like, like it, it's funny. Like, like touring cars, the car is very seldomly perfect. You're mm. always like... 
okay, it's a, it's a 10 out of 10 at turns one, three, and eight. But then it's like, oh, it's a struggle at turn two, and then it's better at turn four. So you're always trying to find the law of averages to make it as competitive as possible, mm -hmm. where I feel like the Astra, everywhere, it's very good. Yeah. Like I'm not having to so like compensate for anything. Um, and I feel like I'm really like clicking with it and gelling with the team more so. How many, do you have um, one teammate or is there a few? So there's two are... teammates and they drive identical cars. So we don't share cars or anything like that. They are in their own cars. Um, are you competing against each yeah, other yeah. or are you and all like, together? Like... We are competing against each other, but at the same time, you are a team. But you want to be the best. Yeah. Like, that's true. Yeah. And they're, they're two very fast rookies, both of which have a very good track Oh, pedigree. they're rookies They are. Well. And it, it's quite like it's... You want to be against the best. And, like, especially when, like, they're probably early 20s i would say i don't know i should probably ask them that <laughs> like, like i should probably try and connect with them like they're but you can tell they're at the start of their journey yeah but they're very good they've like like at the end of the day like i won a race in my debut season in the turning mm -hmm. cars so as a rookie you can still be very competitive and as that saying goes like iron sharpens iron so you want to be surrounded by the best yeah um and i think probably what's probably pegged us ahead of them is probably my like years of experience yeah. in terms of like mm -hmm. feedback in terms of working with the team, the car crew. Because like, while my name is on the windows of the car, like I would say I do the least amount of work in terms of preparing the car. Like I would barely trust myself to make the guys and girls a cup of tea that are on my <laughs> team. Like they, they control how the weekends go. Mm -hmm. And I think when you're younger and you come in, it's very easy if like, you know, they're setting up the car to an inch of its life. Mm -hmm. There are probably 10,000 parameters that have to align to make the setup right, you know, one of those parameters might be out. And it's very easy, especially when you're like young in the game or like getting into it, to be like, oh, why is that wrong? Like if that was right, we would have done X, Y, and Z mm. better. Where people make mistakes. And if they saw how many mistakes I make in the car, it'd be a very one-sided conversation. Yeah. So, and I think that's what's been nice. Like because I've done this, like next year will be my 10th season in the touring cars alone. Wow. Like I've kind of learned the way and learned that it's a team. Everyone wants to go mm -hmm. as well as they can. People make mistakes like I make mistakes in the car. Um, but everyone is striving towards the same goal of, of inevitably trying to win. Um, and I, I think having the two, the two rookie teammates has been really beneficial to me because sometimes it's a fresh set of eyes. I was about to say, yeah, they've, like, they're coming straight yeah, into it. So and they have different experience. Yeah. They've done like, like Andrew has done everything from the 24 Hours of Le Mans to... Oh, everything you, is that, I was going to ask you about that race. Is yeah, that still a thing? It's still a thing. It's, it's huge. A, I think this was like the hundredth year of it or something really? silly. But like he's done that. I think he did that with Aston Martin. So like a very wow. big pedigree. Mikey, who's um, he won like two championships alone last year. He did two different championships and won both of them. Some BMW one and a Janetta one. So like obviously very very good. Mm. But I think where the difference comes from is like the wealth of experience of touring cars. Like, it's yeah. a different form of racing. Mm -hmm. Like, and you always see when people have come from GT programs into touring cars, they can normally do a lap that's a very competitive lap time, but over the course of a race, they really struggle mm -hmm. because they're not used to, like, just how cutthroat it is. Yeah. Like, I would describe myself as, like, a killer in the car. Like, I drive over my own mum to win. Like, I <laughs> don't care. Yeah. And that's the mentality that you have. And while, like, I'm, like, the happy-go-lucky guy, as soon as I get in the car, like it's Don't all I care about is me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, absolutely, and you I'll can't do, be like that. Yeah, I'll do everything. Like, yeah. and that's just how it is. And like the thing is, like I race against this. I've raced against the same people in sharing cars for well the nine years, and mm. they'll be really good friends of ours. Like some of them came to our wedding and everything, but I wouldn't care when I'm in the car, no. and I wouldn't expect them to go easy on mm. me because we're friends. Like, if anything, I'd be annoyed if someone was like, "Oh, because you're my teammate, I kind of let you buy it," but like. Don't do that. No. Just drive your own race. If I'm faster, I will get through. Mm -hmm. Just do your own thing. Don't get in my way because then <laughs> like, that's a pain. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, run your own race and we'll be fine. Um, and that's, it, it's funny. Like, yeah. So I think that's what the mentality that they probably haven't unlocked yet. I yeah. think they have a lot of potential and they'll do very well, but it's, it's a hard game, this, to be fair. Has your mindset changed now that you've become a father? Are you more... Like, everyone expects me to say a really, like, soundbite piece where I'm like, oh, I, I won't take any risks, I won't do this. If anything, I'm inclined to take more risks um, oh, really? because no matter what now, my legacy lives on. <laughs> so I don't care. <laughs> like, I yeah. don't care. Now that Oakley's here, nah, I can do whatever I want. Yeah. And, like, to a degree, like, I think it's changed and it's made me more hungry for success mm -hmm. because I want her to be proud of, what, who, of who I am. Yeah. And, like, in, like... 
10 years time when she's old enough like when she sees the photos of her on the podium when she was like four months old. Oh, they are really so, cool. they're Yeah, cool like bitches. I feel like that's a, it's a really cool thing and her name's on my helmet and yeah. stuff. Like, like I want her to be really proud. Like that's like, people always say to me like, like, do you get nervous before you go out in the car or anything? I don't get nervous at all that like for safety or anything mm. like that. I get nervous because I don't want to let anyone down. Yeah. And I think maybe Oakley has added to that. But if anything, that, drives me even more mm. like I think that's why now I want to make sure that everything I do from this mm. point onwards from the day that she was born is done in a way that when she looks back on this in years to come she's really proud of that yeah. um so yeah I that's think nice, it, it's nice actually set. quite nice though so I'll take more risks um because I don't care because <laughs> she will fly my flag regardless yeah, and I have to do it to make her proud so Oh, yeah. that's lovely. Have you ever had any, like, crushes at all, any bad? I have. So I think my biggest claim to fame is I died. Um, you died? I did. So I had a really good crash at Croft. Oh, my god! Oh, what year was that? 20, 2016, 2017? I don't know. Like, it's funny because I actually don't remember anything of it. I know it was my wife's birthday on the day, but I don't oh remember gosh. waking up in the morning. I don't remember going to the track. The only thing I remember is waking back up in the hospital that night. Oh so I was in a really bad crash. I'm like, um, so I stopped breathing. Um, and when the marshals got to the car, they, so the sequence of what it happens is when an ambulance goes onto the track, they attend to the car that they get to first, if that makes sense, right. first. Yeah. Then they go to second, then they go to third. Luckily, our car was a multiple car crash. Ours was the first. When they got to the car, they were like, oh, that's a fatality. Like there's probably no point in dealing with this, but they still had to like yeah. come to the car. So I had stopped breading. Um, was the car like upside down or anything? It, was, or? it wasn't upside down, but like we went off like, I think like 140 mile an hour into Jeez. a complete stop. Like it's st like my, cause and I- That uh, impact is so that's intense. That's it. Yeah. So like, like, so I stopped breeding. So they cleared oh my, my airwaves, effectively resuscitated me at the side of the track. This is what I'm told. I don't remember any of this. Yeah. Came back around, <laughs> fell back unconscious, came back around, fell back unconscious, all this type of stuff. Broke one of my legs, tore the ligaments in my other leg because of the impact, all this type of... So, but my favorite story that I've been told is our team manager came to the medical center and I had woken back up and it was during qualifying that this crash happened. I asked where I'd qualified and I'd qualified fifth, which I was like, That's, this is yeah. really good. <laughs> so I was like, no, and they're like, yeah, but it's, it's not good. And I was like, no, I'm totally fine. So I got up to try walk out unbeknownst to me that one of my legs was broken and my other leg oh, just wasn't gosh. working. So you didn't feel so like I, anything? I didn't like, feel a thing. So yeah. I just fell straight in the ground. Like, oh literally gosh. straight on the ground. Um, Pass out again. Yeah, 100%. Oh. And then, so, I was in a wheelchair for, I think, maybe three weeks. I had to get the bone. So, you, there was a place down south in England that lasered the bone back together in my leg. Oh, my god! So, they do it for, like, MotoGP riders. So, if a MotoGP rider falls and breaks his collarbone, they can laser the bone back together overnight that it'll have enough strength to ride the bike again in the morning. It's crazy. Whoa. So that's they, crazy. so I had to move into a disabled room in a hotel for like three weeks, got the bones lasered back, the concussion, some magnetic treatment, everything done. And I was back in the car three and a half weeks later for the next round. Wow. So like literally, that's I think I got out of the wheelchair on a Monday and was back in the car on the Wednesday. Um, and like, makes no difference like oh i feel like it just i can't remember any of it so it makes me nah, doesn't doesn't play on my mind doesn't do like, anything did you not think like oh i'm done or was in, if no. anything you like get me back in like. no i was like i like if the car was ready the next day and we'd qualified fifth i would i'd be in that car like there's no doubt about it in my mind but my body probably wouldn't have allowed it yeah um and wow. I, it's funny like you never the safety of it never never really bothers me and if anything, that has probably given me more confidence that I'm, like, indestructible. Like, if yeah. I can survive that, I can survive anything. Like, a little bit of rain ain't going to do I anything. I died, broke my leg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Car, three weeks later. I'm That's totally crazy. fine with this. I'm totally chill. Wow. And, like, I feel like that's probably one of my biggest claims to fame is, yeah, that Yeah, your that family happened. are there stressing, crying. Oh, 100%. Like, there, on like, my wife's birthday. Like, what a scene. Yeah. Like, what, like, I remember... Attention seeking. Uh, well. I think so. <laughs> like, at least, like, like I just, I just wanted to get some media, do you know? Yeah. And no, I remember, I remember she, it was her birthday, and she got to the hospital, and uh, they were like, so he has a severe head injury, and he's his minimum broken one leg. She was like, mm-hmm, okay, this isn't great. So, like, is he going to be, like, a vegetable? Is he going to be all right? Turns out I was fine. Wow. <laughs> um, so I survived that. I can survive anything. So there so. was no, like, so although you got a concussion, I think you were, like, you totally didn't fine. feel anything. I would say the concussion was probably the most annoying part to get over because for whatever <laughs> reason, 
that kept making me get like projectile vomit sick. Don't oh, know why. No. Don't know why. So, but it went away, obviously. After like they did some weird magnetic treatment, same place that lasered the bone back together, like this Doctor Evil. It sounds like I was going to say. It sounds I was like, like you're yeah, I'm like a bionic man yeah. now. I would say now I'm sure it'll come back to haunt me in years to come. But at the same time, right now I feel great. <laughs> so uh, that I did a great right now job. We're thriving. Oh, let's thri- Not just surviving. I'm thriving. Absolutely. Like I feel great. Uh, but yeah, like that was. It was. Do you know, like it's part of the memories. Like I'm like that's a really funny time. Yeah. Like we were like living in a disabled room in a holiday inn. It was, it was brutal. But at the same time, like um, I do it all again. Wow. Like, like I would take all the same risks. I do. I wouldn't change anything. Were the because, other two drivers okay? Um, one of them was in an induced coma for like a oh, wow. few weeks. Um, I can't remember. The other one has never raced. Neither of them have raced again. Oh, really? Um, like one yeah, of you're the one who died in your back. Yeah, I was like, I'm fine. Let's oh my keep gosh. going. Let's roll. Let's it just keep going. It shows your mindset yeah, yeah, where yeah, you yeah, are, yeah. isn't it? That's it's kind of just like, you'll be fine. Like, I think it, it's it's like, it's only as tough as you make it to be. Mm-hmm. Like, at the same time, like, I'd never, uh, it would that would never deter me. Mm-hmm. Um, and it wouldn't, yeah, it wouldn't put me off in the slightest because like, sport any sport's dangerous you could be playing football and you could break a leg like yeah. anything is dangerous like the you irony cross the road and you could 100 percent. the irony of yeah, it is like true. i'll probably be killed by someone trying to like run in a red light one of these days and you've driven <laughs> out a hundred driving test <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> oh, i know it's <laughs> hopefully that isn't me that causes this issue. <laughs> but no like it's that's just part of the sport it's the part of competing and mm-hmm. like and that's what i love like i love the opportunity to compete yeah and that was a chance for me to compete against myself to see if i can do it again and lo and behold I can how did you feel when you went back to the track was Every, it, was everyone it, croft, it was croft yeah. everyone was like oh would you not like would that not play in your mind not on the slightest like but it was the last thing you thought about i was like it. no like it makes no difference because like realistically if i think about it i've probably crashed at every track like really? I, in some capacity i've had it off somewhere mm. so like makes no difference like you're kind of just like this is what you do like like i've always been on the mindset of like even on your greatest days you never let that carry over into the next Mm -hmm. day like you reset and you go again like it's no different to working in a successful company like everything branded like if you've got a new client you still go in as hungry as ever the next day to be the best of what you can do or if you lose a client you still go in and you don't try and make up for it you just do the same process Mm -hmm. and that's kind of how that all worked for me um, that I was like, yeah, I'll just keep on going. Like wow. like nothing has ever happened. That's amazing. I can't believe that. It is mad. <laughs> wow. So um, with podiums, do they ever get old or are they always like... No, like like I think like like it's always nice to have those moments. Mm-hmm. Like all the hard work paying off. Yeah. Like, and I think the one this year is probably like we still have three more rounds. And I think these three races, these three tracks will probably be our strongest tracks of the season, which is quite nice. You get used to, uh, this, is this the first year? With, with Paramount. Yeah. yeah. So, so it is you're indeed. finally used to the car. Yeah. And, and you kind of clicked with it. And yeah. normally these like um, Donington, Silverstone and Brands GP are, are historically my best circuits. Mm. So it's nice that I've coming to them at the end of the year where I've kind of gathered the momentum of fine tuning the car to myself. But yeah, those tastes of success never grow old. And if anything, it's even nice now to have Oakley to share in them. Yeah. Like even having those podium photos with her and like, obviously she's like four months old. She doesn't know what day of the week it is. Like, <laughs> like doesn't care. But at the same time, it means a lot to me. And she'll um, look back and... She will. Oh, like, yeah, like, like all I care about is in 10, 20 years time, she'll be like, oh, my dad was once really cool. Like mm. now he's totally lame. But at one point in his life, he was kind of cool. Um, if we get facts with it, you are the first Irish driver to win yeah, in which, 30 years. So. Which is mad. Like, I feel we'll like... We'll just drop that in. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate it. Like, it's a little stroke of the ego. No, it is cool. <laughs> like, it, it's something that, like, I am really proud of. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, like to win in this championship is so damn hard. Yeah. So, to be the only Irish so many calls to do it, on the track as well. It's like, crazy. It's, yeah. And, like, they're all the best of the best. They're the best drivers, the best teams, the best engineers, the best mechanics. You have to be at the top of your game mm-hmm. to have a glim, a glimmer of of hope of success, um, and we've been really fortunate to to be able to do that and to actually enjoy it. Like, thing is, like even the great days of podiums and whatnot and race wins, there's so many more of them to come. But I enjoy the process of getting to the front just as much. Yeah, like I enjoy the hard work that no one gets to see more than anything. Um, it's like you, you've done the whole journey in the. Um the yeah, just the it is on top like of the on top of the it's cake. funny. Like you, you very seldomly like celebrate the success. Mm. You're kind of like, yeah, that's cool. Like 
You get to see the champagne, like... Yeah, yeah, and then you're like, this is cool. Like, it's really cool that we've done really well. I'm really proud of what I've achieved. But at the same time, we've another race or another two races to go. So let's just park that and go again. Um, Because in my opinion, you're only ever as good as your last race. So to me, you're always wanting to to be as hungry as Mm -hmm. ever. Um, But the success is nice. And again, like, like it's funny, like, in my house, um, we only ever keep, like, one trophy. Every, oh, really? I was yeah. going to say, do you get to keep them off? I you? do, but like, I normally give them to my dad because like, oh, really? I feel like he's my only true fan, to be oh. perfectly honest. Um, but what you got, I'll only ever, we only have one trophy in the house because I just don't like to like over celebrate myself mm. or anything like that. Like, is that me? I'd be having them like all on the wall. Yeah, but, I, but like. I get that. Like, it's funny, like, I, it's, I think that's just part mm. of like, I want to be like, I'm not. I'm not a superstar. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm just fortunate in circumstances. And the, the cards have fallen in my way in certain opportunities. And just because we've won races and done this or done that, I just kind of like, yeah, this is just, I don't know. It feels, I, I would feel like false in myself to over-celebrate it, being like, oh, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm like something special. Because I'm not. Like, I'm kind of just this lucky guy. And eventually someday, people will be like, why on earth is he still doing this? <laughs> like, um, But hopefully that's like 30 years from now. Yeah. So. To be fair, the it. fact how humble you are has probably helps you as a driver. Because yeah. if you think you're the best, you're like, well, you know what? Like, yeah, I've got all these trophies, yeah, and yeah. that. You're gonna, your ego's going to overtake you. 100%. And, you're gonna... like I, and I, I come back to the tangent that I went off at the start about, like, particularly, like, males, like, when they come into this and they get, like, external affirmation, it's really hard to, like, balance that ego mm-hmm. and to realise, like, and sometimes it's so easy to believe your own hype. Where actually, like... You know, on race weekends, I feel like you put on your race suit and everyone treats you like you're your superhero. Mm. But on Monday morning, when I'm driving back to the airport or wherever it may be, and you may stop at a random petrol station, unless they're a touring car fan, they don't care. Mm. So, like, to me, I'm kind of like, like, this is just a very fortunate turn of events yeah. that has led here. And I love, I love getting to share in that. Like, I love getting to share in that with everyone here at, like, Everything Branded because... Like, this is a sport, and it's a sexy sport, but at the same time, we're just normal people. Mm. Like, I wouldn't be getting to do what I'm doing if it wasn't for your work, Steph. So, in that regards, like, it's a huge team effort, mm. and no one ever sees that. They just see, oh, we're, we've Aaron in to do a podcast. Well, no, like, you've done so much prep work. <laughs> you've set up all of this. I've kind of just swooped in and taken some glory for, like, giving up some of my time to come in and have a chat. Like, and I love doing some of this. So... I'm really grateful, like, you should be celebrated. Like, the team here should be celebrated for the work that they're doing because that's what makes well, this... Well, big up Dom and Joey. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> like, like, this is, it's, it's like, and I, I think that's really important to me. Like, anyone who comes to my racing, wants, I want them to feel as much of a part of it as I am mm. because, like, there's not a whole lot that differentiates me from you or me from Dom. Or it, it, we're all the same. Yeah. Like, I'm just really fortunate in opportunities that have come my way. Oh, yeah. that's so lovely to say. Mm-hmm. Just before we wrap up, I'm just going to cool. give you a quick quiz. I've got a few okay. tracks here. Yeah. Um, I want to see if you can guess what they are. Let's test your knowledge. So this one here. I oh feel God. I've been looking at that one on your notes for the last while, so I know that's Alton. Um, <laughs> and it, it, that, so I've kind of cheated on that one a little bit. Now, what I would say <laughs> is like, sometimes, because right now I'm looking at that slightly upside down to normally how I'd see it. So to give you an idea... On our steering wheel in the car, there's always like a circuit map. Oh, is not, there? not so I forget where I'm going, but each corner will be marked. So it'll be like turn mm. one, two, three. So then when we're communicating, I'll show you. When we're like communicating over the radio, we'll be able to say, oh, the car is a bit of understeer at one. It's bad over the bumps at turn two. There's great traction at turn three. And it's about like being able to develop the car base in it. So I'm used to looking at the maps. But if you put them in a different, like, orientation, <laughs> I'm like, what is this? Like, who has made this? Do so. you find it with, like, because tracks like that compared to, let me see if I've got a really difficult one. Like, this, for instance. Yeah. That's, like, which ones, are they hard? Like, because obviously... So, it's, it's funny, like, like yes, yeah, so that's Snetterton. Um, yeah. I know that one. Yeah. Um, that's <laughs> the longest right. <laughs> circle we go to. That's three miles long. And oh, it, wow. it's, it's weird. Three like, miles long. That's do, I, do I think they're any more difficult? Probably not. Mm-hmm. Like, if anything, the shorter tracks, the margin for error is so small. Because, like, when I said a tenth of a second might separate five or six cars, a half a tenth might separate five or six cars mm-hmm. at the likes of Silverstone. So, the mar- you have to, like, be at 110% of your capacity at every corner. The longer tracks, you're never going to have a car that's perfect at every corner. And mm-hmm. it's about maximizing its weaknesses 
to benefit the strengths. So you'll never set the car up for just one corner on the track, even though that one corner could be costing you a tenth, how the car is handling at the rest of the track could be gaining back two tenths. Yeah. Um, so the longer tracks give you more opportunity to develop the car um, and are maybe a little bit easier because they're less stressful in terms of every corner has to be 10 Perfect, tenths. Perfect, yeah. Mm. So for example, this one here, what's, what's this one? Croft. Hey. Yes, got I got it. it. It's, got like it. I, it's like I know where I'm, what I've been doing. <laughs> has been quite a few years of doing yeah. this. Like this isn't my first time looking at a track map. <laughs> Um, so, like, knowledge. So, so, yeah. like, with, so it, on the straight, you can kind of gain positions and then you just yeah. so like, the short, the corners. It, it's, it's funny, like, like, the car, like, it's, don't get me wrong, it's very fast in a straight line, but it's the cornering speeds that dictate how yeah. well you will go. Um, so you're setting the car up to, if you can carry one mile an hour onto every straight off, like, off a corner exit, one mile an hour extra, that'll be worth two or three tenths. Mm -hmm. And those are the finite margins. And like, I keep referring to a tenth of a second, like a tenth of a second is a blink of an eye, but that's the how- The racing, yeah, that's like- that, that, But that, yeah. the, like the actual scientific, like a tenth is just a blink of an eye where that can cover five or six cars in qualifying. Yeah. So when you think of how closely packed everything is, if you can find one mile an hour here or there, you are like obliteratingly fast. Especially because if you have like penalties, that tenth of a second means so much because oh, that could literally take you right down the... 100%. Like it's like motorsport is just marginal gains. Mm. Like you're never going to go out in the car and be like, oh my God, I've gone two seconds a lap faster. <laughs> you'll go out and you'll be like, geez, we found two tenths. This is a really good day. Yeah. Um, and like, you know yourself, like if you ever have gone go-karting with your friends, someone will be five seconds off the quickest person. Mm -hmm like a second will cover from first to 30th yeah. on the grid. Like it's that crazy. is like how, if not less, like it's crazy how competitive it is. And I always look at it like I'm in a Voxel Astra, there's BMWs, there's Hyundai's, there's so many different cars. Like how do they all produce pretty much the same lap time? Yeah. Like all different drivers, all different setups, everything. But yet the championship have done a phenomenal job in making it as competitive as it is. It's crazy. Um, but yeah, it's cool. It's cool. Amazing. Outplay. Well, I'll wrap things up here because cool. I feel like we've been talking for a while. No, that's the problem. Like, Irish by nature, I could talk. I like, know, so could I. Talk, I'm literally... not, so I do apologise. <laughs> no, don't worry at all. It's been amazing. Thank yeah. you so much for coming on. No, it's been lovely to chat it. to you. Likewise, you have to get to a race. Like, I feel like Absolutely. we should do our next one of these in a garage at one yeah. of the tracks. And then we'll have a good old driver on the car. Yeah, no, I can't. <laughs> in case you're better than me. Then, oh, so, true. like, that would be the I biggest mean, issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've yeah, got yeah. my driver's horrendous, to be honest. <laughs> that's four fine, times yeah. If it's taken you four times, I should be in safe hands. Yeah. Amazing. No. Well, thank you so much, Aaron. No, thank you. Really appreciate your time.